Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I run a YouTube channel called Tank Tested and sitting beside me are Scott and Jackie from Project Piaba. So today we're gonna to talk about the Rio Negro River in Brazil and the work of Project Piaba. So I wanna just start us off really simply with what the Rio Negro is. So the Rio Negro is a blackwater river, a tributary to the Amazon River. And it's a massive tributary. It's, it has an outflow of about three times that of the Mississippi River. And it covers a uh, rainfall area about 300,000 square miles. So it's an incredibly large ecosystem. And it's still relatively pristine, and we want to keep it that way. And that's where Project Piaba comes in. So, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about the origin of Project Piaba and what your goal is with Project Piaba? Uh, Project Piaba has been going on since about uh, 1991 or so, and it's based on uh, something that we really stumbled across. Um, uh, we started visiting the region because a lot of aquarium fish come from this particular area, and, uh, and that's what we wanted to see is be in fish heaven in, uh, in the Amazon, where the fish come from. And um, we saw a huge volume of aquarium fish getting shipped out. And in the early days, um, we we're very concerned with seeing all those fish being uh, captured in the forest streams and the floodplain and being shipped out for the hobby. And there are so many sad stories about fisheries uh, and the, the most commonly just overfishing or bycatch or some environment, environmentally destructive practices. And uh, seeing this many fish coming out of this this Barcelos region of the Rio Negro uh, had us worried and so we were doing this in partnership with uh, a professor Dr. Ning Labish Chow at University of Amazonas and he had some students start studying um, this fishery and the fishes that were being captured for export and um, the uh, the overwhelming um, quantity of the fish were cardinal tetras. They represented about 85% um, of the export. So the cardinal tetra was uh, the, the fish focus. So uh, after studying it, we found out um, that we were wrong. Our, our initial assumptions and the conclusions that we jumped to were wrong in many regards. And we'll get more into, uh, into those details. But it was it was so overwhelming that first visit of mine to uh, to to Barcelos that we we've kept at it and it's only become uh, more interesting and more important. Great. So the important thing to note is that at first, when when the project first started, people were like, "Oh no, there's too many fish being exported," and then it really quickly changed to you know the fishery is is so sustainable because of the natural biology of the fish that they really just replenish themselves faster than humans can possibly remove them from the ecosystem. So it's not at risk of being overfished in the way that classical fisheries that we think about are at risk, um, but it actually provides tangible environmental benefit to the area where the fishing activity is occurring. Right, so I'm a natural history filmmaker by trade. I'm a conservationist, and I always get really worried with the idea of bringing wild caught animals into the exotic pet trade. It really gets uh, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up because it's usually a really destructive process. So Jackie, can you talk a little bit about why this fishery is actually good for the sustainability of the Rio Negro as a whole? Yeah, so it's a really counterintuitive thought because like you said, usually fisheries are um, destructive to the environment and usually it's something that has to be very carefully scientifically managed to make sure that you don't cross that line where the fish can't replenish themselves but because of the Rio Negro the way that the water cycle there works the water level raises by as much as 10 meters every flood season so those fish have an enormous expansion of habitat and resources available to them and they respond by breeding so those fish really just boom and bust breed and when the water levels recede, a lot of those fish don't make it back into the river channels and they're sort of trapped in the flooded forest. 
So those are the fish that are being targeted by the fishery. And a lot of those fish don't make it anyway because, you know, as, as we've seen on a lot of, on actually all of our trips when we go as the water levels are dropping, you end up in these forest, um, flooded forests, they're basically just puddles. You have like thousands and thousands of fish living in a puddle that's like ankle deep water. And <laughs> those fish are, are fair game for, for anything that wanted to come along and, and nibble on them or um, for just desiccating in a puddle in the forest. So they're not part of next year's population anyway. Um, so removing those fish from the population really doesn't have a negative impact on how many fish are available next year. Um, and we have 30 years of science to back up how many fish have been exported every year and it doesn't go down based on fishery um, based on fish supply issues, it goes down based on market issues. So um, we really have ways to prove that the fishery is sustainable and, um, and also important because what it does is it provides the people who are living there with a way to make their living that depends on having a good, clean, healthy forest river ecosystem because you can't have this fishery alongside things that are destructive to the environment like slash and burn farming, timber harvest, gold mining, all those things negatively impact the environment and the fish respond by not being healthy, not breeding, not being a viable source of income. So the people know that that's how they make their money and they know that they need to protect that. Right. So I want to open this up to anyone at home that has a question for our two Project Yaba experts. Mm -hmm. But uh, while we uh, wait for questions to come in, Scott, I want to ask you about the people that live there. So the region that we're talking about is about the size of New York State. And there are about 25,000 people that live along the river. So what is their relationship with the fishing industry and what other things might they be doing if fishing is not an option? Sure. Um, the fishing for aquarium fish started in the 1950s. Uh, post post-World War II when uh, suburbia was sprawling and uh, airplanes started going to remote places like the city of Manaus where the fish get internationally exported from. And so it's carried on continuously since the 1950s. And at its peak, um, as many as uh, 40 million Cardinal Tetras were shipped out every year. And this has become very important um, to the people of the region. It's, it's a livelihood that's easily uh, attainable that anyone can, can enter. Uh, they usually have very um, simple equipment, a dugout canoe uh, to, to uh, navigate the streams and get to where the fish are and handmade gear. Uh, the, the dip nets that they use and the, the plastic bag lined baskets that they make to transport the fish um, you don't need a, a lot of investment or or training to become a fisher and so what this has meant is um is a is a continuous revenue stream going to rural people that they use to meet their basic needs they they use it for food and and uh and the essential things that they need and they've been able to rely on the market demand because they have a retrospective perspective of uh, looking at it going back to the 1950s. So they sort of relax. Um, the income is, is very modest, but they're not in poverty. And they know that every year uh, conditions are going to return where it's productive to catch fish. and. People like us fish lovers are going to be uh, buying up a, a lot of Cardinal Tetras. So that's kind of relaxed the people when you, when you don't have that desperation of wondering where your meal is going to come from or how you, you're going to raise your kids. Um, that's a big difference. Again, they're not rich, but, but they're not totally impoverished. And, and that's a, a really significant change. And um, so because the people know that although the, the fish populations are very robust and they return every year, uh, Cardinal Tetras and uh, us aquarists know that they're, they're on the sensitive side. And that's true in the environment as well. If there's any disruption to, the, <clears throat> to not only the rivers, but the floodplain, 
if there's any clear cutting of deforestation or, or large scale agriculture uh, that would influence the, the water quality and Cardinal Tetras would not tolerate it. And since the fishery is so important to them and their lives and their families, and they know that uh, environmental damage will threaten the fish, they, they've been very motivated to keep the environment in pristine condition. And they're doing it mainly for their livelihoods and for the cardinal tetras, but if conditions are good for cardinal tetras, then the forest ecosystem and all the endangered species that live in the, the sometimes terrestrial floodplain, uh, that's, that's all intact and it's all protected. Um, because of the aquarium hobby and because of uh, the imports of Cardinal Tetras and the, the revenue stream going down to the region. So uh, we were quite surprised uh, having at first seeing this super high volume of aquarium fish getting captured in the jungle and sent out for the hobby and having a, a, a negative assumption and then stumbling across these uh, these aspects of where not only is it environmentally sustainable but it actually results in ben benefiting human welfare and creating a very effective driver of environmental conservation. So Jackie, uh, right now we're talking about the Rio Negro but we have a lot of case studies of other parts of the Amazon that have not had the benefit of a fishing industry that has kept the population uh, employed. Yeah. What does other parts of the Amazon look like without an industry like this? I'm so glad you asked that, Alex, because I think um, a lot of times when people think about conservation and when they think about um, preserving the environment and saving the rainforest, they think about the rainforest as being something that exists without humans. And in this, in basically everywhere, people are part of the environment. And so the the rural families and the villages and the people who live there, you can't just say, save the rainforest. They have to have a way to make their living and support their families. So in areas of the Amazon where there are not, where, where this fishery does not exist, it's rampant with environmental destruction. There's, there's fires for clear cutting, there's cattle ranching, there's soybean agriculture, things that are destructive for the environment and that actually have the ability to change the climate in that area um, in, in ways that, you know, like it's, people tend to think of it as a far off place, but the Amazon is so important to humanity in general in terms of like weather patterns and, you know, water cycle stuff and like just, you know, being a carbon sink for... Yeah, can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? Because yeah. we certainly have seen a lot of news in this past week on our changing planet and how devastating climate change is going yeah. to be for all of us. What is the value of keeping this forest around oh, for all of the world? The value of keeping this forest is so huge. So we actually commissioned a study from uh, from a, a company called Carbon Co. Um, to figure out how much carbon is preserved in the area where this fishery is occurring. And it's something like 7.6 billion metric tons of carbon sequestered just in this forest where this fishery that we've been studying since the 90s is occurring. Um, so it's very, it's a very small section of the Amazon, but if you extrapolate it to think about how much carbon the Amazon in general stores, it's, it's an immeasurably immense number. And it's so important in terms of like removing carbon, you know, we're, we're worried about, um, we're worried about global climate change and removing carbon from the atmosphere is such a big deal to um, preventing or, or at least offsetting how much carbon, you know, is being put into the atmosphere by human activities, but in other cases in other parts of the Amazon, so like down south, where there's rampant fires and burning, the Amazon is actually a source of carbon to the atmosphere. There was actually a paper that I saw um, earlier this year that was like, I read it and I was just like, you know, <laughs> it's scary. It's scary to think about how much carbon, you know, if you, so, so leaving the forest intact removes carbon from the atmosphere and helps mitigate climate change. Setting the forest on fire and doing all of those things that happen in the absence of a sustainable, environmentally benign way of making a living like the fishing industry. So the things that happen in that absence are actually release carbon into the atmosphere and destroy the environment in ways that are irreparable. So you can't just replant it, you know? Right. So. Scott, you've been going down to the Rio Negro for 30 years now. 
Uh, have you seen any, have there been any major events that have changed the course of the fisheries in that 30 years that you've been going down? Um, there, there have been. Um, when I first went in 90, 1991, um, may have been the peak of the fishery. Uh, when, when I mentioned that number earlier, 40 million individuals, um, it was just uh, amazing to see that volume of fish, to see uh, the boats that carry freight up and down the Rio Negro loaded um, with aquarium fish was really uh, pretty overwhelming. And um, so there's a similar species of fish that occurs in the Peruvian Amazon and in a region where the rivers there are fed from the Andes and it's affected the water chemistry to be much similar, uh, much more similar to um, water chemistry on fish farms and in home aquariums. Um, the Rio Negro being extremely acidic but in Peru it was closer to neutral. So the fish is the, the neon tetra and the Neon Tetra uh, also was exported uh, at least in the 1950s and I'm sure before and since that species occurs in water that's uh, similar to fish farms that fish is, um, is farmed in high volumes um, as opposed to the Cardinal Tetra the only source of them uh, was for the most part the, the Rio Negro so the neon tetras, um, there's a, there isn't much of a, of a fishery for wild neon tetras because of the cost of air freight and freighting them from the Peruvian Amazon out to the international markets is a significant cost and if they could be bred and produced closer to the markets it was more profitable for, for the industry. So um, we feared that uh, the aquaculture, fish farming technology would advance um, and use some of the techniques that are that are that were becoming available back then to uh, to to breed cardinal tetras. You can you can treat them with hormones and force them into breeding condition and have them spawn and of that next generation you can select some specimens that appear to be uh, tolerant of the, the water quality on the, on the farm and soon you can have a domesticated strain of cardinal tetras that look just like a cardinal tetra but they're very different in that they thrive in uh, near neutral pH water. So this was done and, um, and it, it, it's, it's done in high volumes in the Far East and uh, it's such a beautiful fish um, that there was the justification to invest in these uh, to develop the techniques to be able to produce the fish and so um, there is a, a precipitous decline in exports when um, the Cardinal Tetra uh, started being farmed ex situ out of, out of the Amazon. If I can just chime in, it went from 26 million fish exported per year to 2.7 million fish exported per year so it's it's a huge difference and if you think of the price of those fish and what the impact on the local economy is it's it's an enormous difference so uh, we became very concerned with the fate of the fishery and Project Piava started as a, an academic study um, but after learning um, how low impact it was on uh, on, on the target species and the socioeconomic importance of the fishery and how it acts as a driver of environmental stewardship, we, we became very concerned that the fishery might collapse entirely. So we became a little bit more of a, a, a problem solving and an advocate group for this fishery. Um, some of the, the farm raised cardinals were bred specifically for the aquarium trade and they were more suitable, they were more hardy in aquariums as opposed to the fish that came from the wild and the very acidic water um, needed some extra care and conditioning to be brought up to, to, to condition for, for the aquarium trade. So it became clear that we needed to work on developing uh, best handling practices to minimize any stress or trauma on the fish 
and to condition them in a way through uh, through acclimation to a higher pH water and better nutrition for the overall condition of the fish um, and using proper uh, handling techniques and, and packing techniques for shipping. Um, that was very important to, to, to implement throughout the fishery for them to compete with the wild fish. The other aspect that we're working on is actually the story of the Cardinal Tetras and the role it plays in the Rio Negro environment because fish hobbyists are conservationists. They care about the environment, they care about the Amazon. And our hope is that if they know that they can buy fish and have some of the, uh, the money go into this revenue stream, going down to this region and, and driving, driving conservation, then they'll, they'll choose those fish. And the aquarium industry itself uh, is having some challenges with people that are opposed to having wildlife in captivity. Um, there are a lot of people that are, are uh, vehemently op opposed to, to having fish in captivity and that's resulting in some different regulations that make it, make it difficult and it also decreases um, people from entering the hobby because if they hear bad things about it they, they might want, not want to do it if they feel like it's bad for the environment. Yeah. So this case study is very important for the aquarium trade to show that in this particular situation the fishery uh, for the aquarium trade is not the problem it's actually the solution yeah. yeah so we've got a few questions coming in from the audience that i want to uh kind of collate and uh they're all kind of subjects on a same theme so i think this will work so first thought that comes through is the idea of should we be buying uh, wild caught, sustainably caught fish rather than tank raised fish uh, to support our you know ecosystems? And that's an interesting thought. It's something that I really have struggled with myself because intuitively it feels like you should never buy wild caught animals. If you want to support the wild and the nature of our planet, you shouldn't be taking anything from it. But the Rio Negro fisheries are certainly an exception. And I want to emphasize that, that they are a sustainable fishery. It doesn't mean that all wild-caught fish are sustainable. Fish from the Rio Negro caught sustainably are sustainable. And that leads me to another question, which... Um, Alex, if I, can I interrupt you for a second and tackle that slightly? Yeah. Um, so when we think about fisheries, like a lot, of, a lot of people have... So like you said, it really depends on the individual fishery, right? And a fishery yeah. isn't just... Um, like wild caught fish. It is right. fish from a place, from a particular population of breeding stock, from a particular place that are related ecologically. So cardinal tetras from the Rio Negro are a different type of fishery than cod in the North Atlantic. Um, right. right. So, so when you think about fisheries, every story is different. So you really do have to know what you're doing. But we do have 30 years of science. And you can check out on our, our website, projectpiaba.org, we have a tab that's connected to publications. So you can go back and read our papers for, you know, some of the, the ones from, from the early 90s you have to kind of hunt for because they're on, like, microfiche. So you have to, like, find them on ResearchGate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I have those printed up in my special binder. Um, but we do have the numbers to back that up. And so this is so different than when you think about, like, you know, it's different than some of the reef fish that are collected right. unsustainably, and it's different from some of the other fisheries that, you know, like this is the one that we've studied. So we feel very confident telling you that cardinal tetras from the Rio Negro are environmentally beneficial. So it's more than sustainable. It actually has a positive impact right. on and, the environment. And so I want to circle back on that because Richard Mac McCarthy, uh, said this comment I would let I would so love an easy way to have fish labeled as sustainable before I buy them mm -hmm. so Jackie can you talk a little bit about the work of Project Piaba to get the geographic indicators oh, yes. attached to fish yes we have some very exciting stuff that's happening right now in the project um, we're actually just waiting on funding um, and to like implement this and we'd probably have it done already if it weren't for COVID um, <laughs> ruining our plans 
but um, so some of the work that we're doing now is with geographic indication. So like Champagne is authentic if it's from the Champagne region of France, right? Things that are geographically indicated are authentic when they're from that particular place. So Cardinal Tetras now, um, we have a, um, the woman that leads our Brazil team, Mari Balsan, is um, up like she's amazing she's a professor of economics and she's been involved in geographically indicating wines um, and so her hard work really paid off here to make cardinal tetras the first live animal to receive geographic indication so authentic cardinal tetras are from the rio negro so that's really cool and part of that process is that there's a traceability component that's impact that's part of that right so now cardinal tetras um, once we finish the traceability piece and are able to connect all the dots, you'll be able to see an individual fish when it's captured from a stream, when it's scooped out, put it into a bucket, and then transferred downriver when it goes to an export facility, when it goes to an import facility, when it goes to a wholesaler, when it goes to a fish store, when it goes to your tank, you'll be able to scan a QR code and see every step of that chain or every step of that chain that doesn't violate people's privacy. but you'll be able to see where that fish was caught, what stream it came from, and a little bio biography of who caught your fish. So how cool would that be to be able to see It would be amazing, and it, yeah. and it addresses that issue of we want to make sure that we are being uh, good consumers that are doing yeah. what we want, like we want to support the system, and it's very confusing when mm -hmm. things are not properly labeled. Which leads me to another question um, that was asked, let's see if I can find it again. Um, bear with me. So, uh, Scott, this is a question. Um, do stores like the big box stores uh, support sustainable fisheries at all? Is there any impetus to, to make that happen? Um, I think they can to the best degree that they're able. Um, Cardinal Tetras, we still need to broaden the best handling practices and, and acclimation and, and conditioning to have them suitable for the big box stores. Um, but they, they recognize that sustainability is an important issue and they, they do their best. And uh, I'm very optimistic that in, in uh, the next coming years, we will be able to um, have the fish coming out consistently in a very high quality that the that the box stores demand we already have a lot of the supply chain in place um, a lot of the importers slash fish farmers that provide the fish to the box stores are carrying cardinal tetras and they are currently distributing them to some of their their buyers that are also enthusiastic about this program and helping us uh, uh, fine-tune the, 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 the quality of the fish and that's been growing and expanding and uh, I'm sure that soon um, Cardinal Tetras will be will be ready for everybody in the industry yeah so, so what Scott's getting at yeah. is that um, right now so we've been working on the best handling practices for for probably more than 10 years at this point mm -hmm. um, and the the quality of the fish and the health of the fish is improving exponentially, but it still is to the point where they require a little bit more care when they come out of a box. So like a, a mom and pop fish store where, where the people who are who are unpacking the fish are fish fish heads, right? And are able to like, you know, mind melt with those fish and know what they need and spend a little bit more time and care for them are able to make this work really well. But you know, when you work at a big box store, it's more like volume, 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 right? And so a lot of times the employees and the the systems are not really set up to be able to pay more attention to those fish you know what I mean so it's it's sort of um, soon it's going to be to a point where those fish are just exactly the same as any other box of fish that comes in and you can just put them in your tank and they're ready to go right um, so that that brings up another question folks have been asking um, and I, I asked this knowing that Project Piava is a small volunteer nonprofit. <laughs> Nobody gets paid for this. Right. <laughs> so there's a limited bandwidth and lots of things to do. Is there any uh, plan or hope to create an online database of what local fish stores are carrying 
Rio Negro Cardinal Tetras. Um, so that consumers can buy fish that are from the Rio Negro. I'm glad you asked. So we have, um, it's, it's in its infancy, but on our website, projectpiaba.org, there is a tab for store locator. And so you can put in your zip code in that and it'll tell you what stores in your area that we know of are bringing in Rio Negro fish. So there, you know, there's certainly stores that are not on our list because, you know, what, what fish stores do to run their business is not our business, right? We just kind of make these recommendations and say, hey, have you heard about wild caught fish from the Rio Negro? And a lot of times they're like, no, I haven't. I would like to import those, right? So um, those are just the ones that we know of. But if you walk into your local fish store and you ask them, where did you get your fish from? Most of them, because they're running a business, they're buying fish from somewhere, they know where their fish are coming from. So you, if you ask specifically for these fish and tell them why you care about it, it's really a consumer-driven um, impetus for environmental change, right? Because, you know, as, as people who care about the environment, we make thoughtful choices every day about the products that we buy. You know, if you would, you know, I recently just bought a new vehicle and I went out of my way to make sure that it was the most fuel efficient model that fit my needs. Um, and, you know, when we buy our coffee, we care about fair trade. We care about, you know, how our products are, are produced, right? And so why not about our fish tanks too? Because the, the aquarium fish industry is something like a $20 billion industry, right? It's huge, it has a huge amount of money. And when you think about the, the money that's going into the Rio Negro fishery, right? Um, I had a number somewhere, it was like, it was like $23, $23 million over between 2006 and 2015. There isn't a conservation organization in the world that can write a check that big to preserve the rainforest, right? You can't, you know, the, and the aquarium fish industry is doing that on its own just by consumers putting their money where their values are. Um, so if you walk into your fish store and you say, this is what I care about and this is why, a lot of times um, people who are running that store will also care about those things, right? So so ask, you know, be, be friendly with the people who you buy your fish from because it's important. <laughs> right. So I want to pivot this conversation a little bit um, because we've talked a little, we've talked about the sustainable work of Project Yaba, but I want to celebrate the ecosystem of the Rio Negro a little bit more. And both Scott and Jackie, you are professional aquarists, mm -hmm. and you've also been to the Rio Negro many times. So Scott, can you tell us a little bit about the actual habitat that these animals are found? What is the Blackwater River of the Rio Negro? Yes, uh, the Rio Negro uh, gets its name from its color, its black color. Um, and the water chemistry of the Rio Negro is very unique. And um, there are several factors that, that, that have that result of causing this, this unique water. And by unique, I mean uh, extremely low pH, as I mentioned before. Um, pH is a 4.5 are quite common, uh, but we've also found uh, water with pHs below 3 where, uh, where fish are living. And so there's a uh, fluctuation in the water level um, every year. There's a high water season and a low water season. And um, the, the difference is about 10 meters. So it's huge. The, the river water level goes up 30 feet. And there isn't a lot of elevation in the land, in the, in the basin of the Rio Negro. So it floods uh, massive am amounts of, of what had been uh, dry land it is suddenly inundated under, uh, under 30 feet of water. And w that water uh, goes out via the main channel of the Rio Negro and the way it gets there is it leaches through the ground and as the water goes through the ground it comes in contact with a lot of the de decaying organic matter which um, results in these uh, particular uh, aspects of, of the water. It, it releases tannins that stain the water and give it that black color and uh, there's tannic acid that reduces the uh, the pH of the water. There's no there's no buffer in the water. The alkalinity is extremely low, so the uh, the tannins can really send the pH down low. And we as aquarists have been simulating this for a long time. Um, right now, it's quite popular to have biotope aquariums, and there are suppliers that have all sorts of material 
that can help simulate this. But in the early days, we would boil peat moss or use oak leaves and do the same process that happens in the Rio Negro floodplain to condition water for discus and angelfish and other, other acid water fishes. Um, so even though the water is, has very low visibility, it's very, it's very dark, um, there's very little suspended solids. There's very little organic material in the water. In c contrast to the Amazon River that comes at a very fast velocity from the elevation of the Andes, it does carry a lot of silt and a lot of organic material that feeds the different trophic levels. It feeds the uh, microscopic animals that, that live in the Amazon and, and that means leads to a very rich environment. And that's where a lot of the giant Amazon fishes come from, the red-tailed catfish, Paku, Arapaima. But in the Rio Negro, where there's so little organic material, it's hard to be a fish. It's like an underwater desert almost, with no food at all. And because of that, the fish populations have miniaturized and they've diversified quite a bit to develop different specialties, special forms to, to get food. So, because of the hydrodynamics in the, in the floodplain and how that's affected the water chemistry, there's lots of weird little fish that live in this Barcelos region. And we as hobbyists love weird little fish. Um, sure do. <laughs> and so, uh, just because uh, of the chemistry and the, the topography of the area, it's a, it's a paradise for, for so many different forms of, of aquarium fish. It's, Amazing. it's the perfect place. So, like 250 species that are common in aquariums come from this area, and and it's soon it's gonna it's gonna be more. Um, yeah. There's so so Jackie, uh, I know that you also have blackwater aquariums at home. You've also <laughs> re been very careful in documenting all of the places that Project Yaba visits. Yeah. So I was wondering, could you pick from your brain one of your favorite little streams or tributaries or places that we visit? For the Project Yaba and tell us in detail like what that habitat is like so folks at home can imagine where these animals actually come from. Yeah, sure. So um, I would first, I would tell anyone who wants to see the habitat to check out our YouTube channel because this sort of started during COVID. We were like, oh, let's do something to like, you know, people were losing their minds, right? We're like, let's do something to sort of engage people and give people a fishy escape, um, you know, from the world. So we've been putting a video of Blackwater or Clearwater Rio Negro habitat online on our YouTube channel every single Friday um, since you know April of 2020. So there's a lot of videos up there of just fish yeah. habitat, and they are a great <laughs> reference. If you're considering setting up an aquarium, what an incredible reference that channel yeah. is. But yeah. let's hear let's hear a favorite so spot. So I I have to say of all the places that we've been, my favorite is Daraqua. It's a it's an Igarape, so it's like a it's like a flooded. Um, so in the flooded forest, there are these small streams that flow through. So like there's the the puddly area where the forest floods and then the water recedes. But then there's like these canoe paths that go through. So it's kind of like a deeper. It's like a cut of creek going through woods that are sort of flooded and and puddly. Um, so it's a really neat habitat because as the water level goes up and down, you know, you end up with fish that are sort of in their puddle and fish that get out of the puddle and fish that are in the creek and fish. It's just fish explosion everywhere, right? And so there were places where, where I was filming fish in a puddle that's ankle deep, right? I'm like standing in a puddle, like trying to, like sticking my iPhone in the water, filming like hundreds of cardinal tetras, rummy nose tetras, um, hemigramus. Um, there's there's a couple species of hemigramus down there that are like impossible to tell apart, but we saw hemigramus boladi and hemigramus annulus and um, hemigramus hyannuary and several several undescribed species of Munchausia that like I didn't even know what I was looking at when I was seeing these fish. So um, it was really cool to just be in the wild habitat and like to see fish that you know that I know are not in the aquarium trade that no one has ever seen and like when I put these on YouTube people are like oh my gosh I've never seen that fish and it's like well they, they're not being exported like they're people people who are doing the fishing activity don't like they they sort of the way things have operated since the 50s is um, somebody orders fish and people go out and they catch the fish that they know that they can sell right and so there's a, a gap 
between what hobbyists know exists and like we would want the fish if we knew they existed but we don't know that they exist <laughs> right right so hopefully um with the the traceability stuff that's coming hopefully we can sort of close some of that gap and be like here are some fish that are there that you know like so so hemigramus analyst for for example that is a fish that we saw at every place that we went to but almost no one has seen them in the hobby like they were they were by far the most plentiful fish that we saw there but they don't exist outside of the amazon and one of the things that I found really compelling, and it's, it's obvious when you think about it, but these small streams, they are filled with microhabitats even within mm -hmm. themselves. So you can have a stream or a little tributary that's quite slow moving with very, very shallow banks where there's 10 or 15 feet before you get to the deep part of the stream that's only a few inches deep in, in uh, water level. And in those areas, you have a lot of the small tetras. You have your cardinals, you have your rummy noses. Uh, but that area is too shallow for the larger cichlids to live. So as you go a little bit deeper into the stream, suddenly there are the fallen branches. And within those branches, there are cichlids living in that same ecosystem, just a few feet away from these tiny, tiny little tetras. Yeah. Um, and then underneath those branches are the habitats where some of the catfish and yeah. plecos live. Jaguar catfish, all kinds of cool plecos. Uh, I mean, it's and just... <laughs> it, it really ra raises this, like, I don't know. In my mind, when you see it on an aquarium at home, you might see three or four or five species mm -hmm. in a well-maintained aquarium where they each species has enough fish to exhibit natural behaviors. But when you go into the Rio Negro and you see the actual wildlife, there could be a hundred species it's an in one stream. Of fish, yeah. <laughs> it's really extraordinary to see. And that's not something that we can really replicate in our home aquarium. Yeah. But it is cool to remember that that is what's happening. It's cool to think about. And it's also really, um, really important to think about the way that the fish interact with that habitat. So yeah. it's, it's a forest floor that's flooded. So it's all like leaves and sticks and branches and things that have fallen into the water from the forest. And the fish interact with those in such important ways like you'll see like um one of my favorite cichlids um actually I, every cichlid is my favorite cichlid but um <laughs> <laughs> there's these little guys called dichrosis cichlids checkerboard cichlids and they just they have such goofy little personalities they're like they're this big they're you know three three inches maybe max and they just kind of like scoot along like these little branches and things and under the leaves and they like peck at things um, and they just are so cool the way that they like they'll flip over leaves to like see what's under them and like you know explore and just do all those fishy things like one will you know side eye another and be like hey get out of get out of my leaf you know and so it was just awesome to see and like a lot of times when people build an aquarium they've got like you know a glass box and some gravel and they put the fish in or maybe like a little castle or something but but um, it really opens a door for things that you wouldn't think of like like leaf litter and um, driftwood and branches and things like that that really enhance the natural behaviors of the fish and make them so much more interesting to watch because like we've we've successfully replicated that behavior um, with dichrosis in, in an aquarium tank when you just clutter the tank. <laughs> you know, you, you see more natural behaviors for, from them. Right. So, Project Giaba goes on a trip every year uh, down to the Rio Negro. Except for COVID. Yes, except for this past year. Um, and on that trip, it's a little bit of a mix of fundraising for Project Giaba and doing real science. So Scott, can you talk about some of the science work that's done on these expeditions down to the Rio Negro? Yes, we, we run a program. Um, this particular one usually runs at the end of January and uh, we multitask a lot. We usually bring out uh, a handful of our Project Piaba Brazil team uh, for them to advance the, the special areas that they're working on. But it's an opportunity to bring um, hobbyists and people in the aquarium trade down to the Rio Negro so they can see this place themselves. And um, we um, have, we're convinced that the fishery is, is a good thing. So a lot of the fishery assessment happened in the, in the early years. We continue to monitor it. Um, but we not only understand that the fishery is a good thing, we, we know that the fishery is in decline and is threatened with collapse. 
if the collapse is allowed to occur, uh, we're very worried about what will happen to the people and what they'll shift to to, um, to uh, provide for their families. But during this expedition, we, we uh, get a lot done. We may be uh, focusing, well, we're usually focusing on a little bit of everything. With best handling practices, we see fish at various stages of the supply chain and we assess their uh, water quality and the physical condition of the fish. Uh, we can examine the fish to determine if the fish have been traumatized or if they're in a state of stress. And if that's the case, we backtrack it to find out what was the source of the stress. We've, we've, we've done most of that. We've identified a number of areas where the handling can be slightly modified to have a dramatic improvement on the, the well-being uh, of the fish. And when, we've, when we compiled all the places that could be improved, we uh, developed uh, the changes in the techniques, how the techniques with the least amount of modification possible would need to be shifted to have these benefits to the, to the fish welfare. Um, and also, uh, Jackie had mentioned um, traceability. It's, it's complicated to, to track uh, individual fish from Amazon streams to living rooms. Um, and we're working on all the different phases of the, of the uh, supply chain to be able to keep these fish, usually in groups associated with the fisher, um, keep them marked and labeled and tracked and we want that tracking to go all the way to the retailer and go to, to, the, to the hobbyist. Um, and our team in Brazil uh, has various areas that they're leading on, they're, they're, they're focusing on. And so this is an opportunity for them to get out into the field. This um, end of January um, timing of the trip, we do it to coincide with the Ornamental Fish Festival of Barcelos, where they built a stadium uh, specifically to, to, to have this this massive festival and tens of thousands of people come to attend they come from all their rural communities they come in town to Barcelos for this this weekend festival and we have uh, videos of that on our YouTube channel so uh, check out the fish festival you really won't believe it and if you're a fish ho a fish hobbyist you play a role in that you're you're the ones that that are driving all this. It's you that choose to buy these fish and, and, and support the economy of Barcelos and uh, provide the incentive for them to, to celebrate uh, the aquarium fish. So I think so, you'll be and, amazed. And, and I also will be posting a video in the next month or two of that festival on Tank Tested, which should be really, really special. I, we've got to wrap up. Ah. Uh, but, I know, but Jackie, can you tell folks at home how they can support Project Piaba and become a part of the solution with the Rio Negro? Yes, um, so there's a, a couple of actionable things. So to support Project Piaba, the best thing that you can do is walk into your local fish store and say, where do you get your fish? I'm interested in that. I care about this. Um, so you can certainly spread the word. The biggest thing that you can do is care. Um, also, we are completely volunteer run. We, nobody gets paid to do this. We depend entirely on um, fundraising from outside sources, right? We, not, we don't have any you know, endowment or anything like that. So if you feel compelled, you can donate on our website. We have a donate tab. Um, you can follow our YouTube channel. You can follow our Facebook, our Instagram, um, and just be involved and care and spread the word with your other, with your fishy friends about how important this project is and how it can actually drive um, conservation. Um, and actually, we're, we're doing a cool thing. Um, so we're, we're partnering with Mars right now. They're doing a, a it's called the Guardians of Aquatic Life. Um, it's a quiz. And so like basically you go online, you take the little quiz, and then Mars is actually donating to Project Piaba um, in, in relation to people taking this quiz. So um, that's, a, that's a thing too. And they're, they're a, a company that also cares about sustainability. So if you want to check them out on, on their stuff, they're, they're all about where they source their things from. And, and they're, they make good quality products too, so. Perfect. Well, Neat on thing. that note, uh, I think we've got to wrap it up because there's another stream coming on this channel in just a few minutes. <laughs> so thank you, Scott and Jackie, for thank joining you. us. And thanks everyone at home for watching. 
and uh, hope that you can us in person at Aquashella sometime soon. Thank, Thank you. you all.